Good morning, everybody. I don't know how many people will have show up on Sunday morning. I never do, but I'm excited to be here with you and excited to be uh, talking to the group. I hope I get to see most of you this coming weekend at the retreat at uh, Sean's house, which should be a lot of fun, and I hope you'll learn a lot as well. Um, I'm going to jump right into the questions and then answer these, and uh, we can go from there. So this is from uh, Gabriella uh, Binkley. And the question she asks is, is it improper to ask a question to avoid sharing details of their financial situation during a sales call or consultation? Okay, I was in a free consultation session with a lead. They wanted to go straight into talking about my pricing because they felt they wanted my services immediately. Once I shared my pricing with them, the lead immediately started talking about their recent financial changes and informed me that my pricing was higher than they thought they'd have to pay for the service I was offering. I managed to cut the deliverables down, which would cut down my time also. I gave a new price, but it was still a little high for them. I'm fine with walking away from this inquiry. Well, Gabriella, I think you handled that pretty well, actually. I don't think that I would have changed much about it. However, when somebody says, how much is your service before I've had a chance to explain them to the service, I usually defer it by saying, I'm going to get to that. I'm going to make you a tailor-made suit for a hand-me-down price. But just like a good tailor, I've got to get your measurements. I've got to see what your needs are. I've got to understand more about your business. And then we'll get to the price, okay? Then I do my needs assessment. And I have those questions pre-planned. And then I present who I am and what I do and the benefits of working with me. And then I present the price. And I do something called the price buildup. So when I introduce the price, even if I have to do it early, sometimes I say, well, the price is the very best thing about it. You know, a lot of people guess that this would be four or five, six thousand dollars a month, but actually I do all this for just two thousand dollars a month. And then they have a hard time pushing back on price because you've already told them that it's a bargain. All right. And so, Gabrielle, I hope that helps. The next question is from Crystal Reyes. Hey, Crystal. Uh, how do I determine or calculate the right pricing according to my expenses? I'm a nail technician in the beauty industry. I'm feeling like I may be undervaluing myself and my pricing, but I just feel stuck. I have check price menus in my area, but they aren't booth rental. They are commission based. So let me say this. First of all, you're going to have to charge what, a, what the competitors charge. You know, Jiffy peanut butter may be better, and it may be worth three or four cents a jar better, but it's not worth a dollar a jar more better. And so you have to realize first thing that drives your price is what the competitor is pricing. Now, if you can't make a living at what the competitor is pricing, then you need to look at your expenses and figure out a better way to uh, deliver your services at a lower cost. But in the free market, which we all operate in, competition and price are reality and we have to be responsive to that. Now, uh, the other thing is you've got to figure out what your expenses are. And I guess your expenses are booth rental, so that's your expenses, and then your time, and then whatever materials you're using to deliver your service, the nails. And so that that all those expenses go into establishing your price and then you have to charge some amount that would be a reasonable amount for an hourly wage. Maybe that's $10 an hour. Maybe that's $350 an hour. But you have to figure out what that is for you and what you would be willing to um, to work for. Okay? So I hope that helps, Crystal. Next, uh, Ricardo. Hey, Ricardo. Uh, the barbershop man. How do I keep myself affordable and keep track of my goals? I'm looking for ways to start tracking my goals, both in business and personal. Are there any strategies y'all can recommend to me or simply advice to start? Thank you for your help. So in the pro code videos, there are lots of videos on goal setting. First thing is watch those. The second thing is that there is a goal setting system in my book, The Boxcar Millionaire. So if you don't have that, buy it or see if Sean will give you a copy. Um, and then the next thing is that you follow proven goal setting systems. And you might Google that, goal setting systems, and you'll see others besides mine. But they're all basically the same. Write it down. 
Tell somebody important to you about your goal so you're committed to it. Set a time frame so that you can have a finish line. Either you win or you lose. Set uh, high goals and low goals. High goals, a man's reach at his seat is grasp for what's heaven for. Low goals, a goal once set, then death or victory. Your low goal should be whatever you need to pay your bills. Now, the next part of it is activity goals. So, you know, you expect people to walk in. That's great. But you also have to do outreach. So outreach is done in two ways. Personal sales, phone calls, in-person meetings, or advertising and marketing. And so you've got to figure out what uh, you are going to do in those areas in terms of activity to get the results that you want. So activity and results goal. And then once you set these goals, hold yourself accountable to this standard. No excuses accepted today. No excuses accepted today. N-E-A-T. Okay? And that's my advice on goal setting. So this is from Carrington. Uh, are landing pages a good way to expand your reach and get people talking about you? Well, if they aren't a good way to expand your reach and get people to talking to you, then people are spending billions of dollars wasting. Of course, they're, they're valuable, they're good, and they help. And so I'm sorry I don't have a more or lengthier explanation, but there are plenty of people in the AO organization that do digital marketing, and they can explain to you the value of landing pages better than I can. HA is a, a, a good one, Coots. Um, so you might reach out to him and ask his advice. Okay. Uh, Robin Turpin. Hey, Robin. Always count on Robin for a question. How much time would you recommend blocking in for networking with potential prospects? Well, the immediate answer to that is how much time do you have? I mean, that's all you ought to do. You know, the highest and best use of your time, Robin, is talking to people during the times you can talk to them. And then the highest and best use of your time before, let's say, 8 o'clock and after 5 o'clock is painting or doing artwork, you know? And, you know, nobody got successful working 40 hours a week. People get successful working 60, 80, 90 hours a week, you know? My partner uh, in contracts, it's about a $60 million business now, um, and it's worth about $450 million. He's, and he's uh, the largest individual shareholder, you know? So you can do the math, but anyway, <laughs> You know, Michael still works 80 hours a week. He's got two kids, a wife, and, you know, he still works 80 hours a week, sometimes 90. You know, you just have to work hard if you want to have continued success, okay? So, Robin says, as an artist, I help people feel moments of calm through my oil paintings of sunsets. And that's an excellent elevator pitch, Robin. That's excellent. But what I want you to do is go online and Google quotes about art. And I've worked with one other artist and it was interesting to see the quotes about art because they make for an excellent elevator speech, you know, and um, they make for an excellent mission statement as well. So I hope I see you in a week and I hope that helps. The next question is from Bob Gigier. I hope I pronounced that right, Bob. And he asked this question, is leading with price the best way to start a sales conversation with a prospect? He's promoting a software and services package that is drastically less expensive than competitors. At the top of my funnel, get prospects on demo calls. Should my messaging be focused just on price? The goal of my business is to make cybersecurity tools more accessible to organizations by reducing total cost of ownership. The existing solutions from the niche I have high costs for software licenses and services. I'm developing a super lightweight software solution to solve the same problem at 20% the price of other options. My target companies would have 3,000 employees and my solution would be priced at 20,000 versus 100,000 by competitors. Okay, so Bob, um, there's nothing wrong with being the low cost provider. It's a, it's a good position to be in the market. You know, what happens usually as you grow, you get bigger and you don't have to be the low cost provider anymore, but it's an excellent way to get started. And I, I, this isn't your question, but if I was a startup and I had software and I've had a few of these, I would give the first four or five away, at least for the first 90 days. 
and that way I'd get some customers that I could reference and I'd also have some experience in working with uh, uh, customers that could introduce me to other prospects, okay? So, but to answer your question, no, you do ne not lead with price. You would never lead with price. The outline for a sales organization is, I mean, for a sales presentation is discussed in the pro code videos, okay? And this is the outline. Establish rapport. How you doing? Where are you from? How long you been here? Where are we at before that? Okay. Then the second part of the presentation is a needs assessment. So tell me this, what are you doing with cybersecurity now? Have you had any hacks? Have you had any uh, lost data? Have you ever uh, wondered if people were actually hacking your system or not? And, it, and you ask them questions related to cybersecurity. And then the next thing is that you uh, explain your product or service and you do it this way. This is who I am, this is what I do, and the benefits of working with me are an unbelievable product at the lowest price in the market, right? And so you've got to sell price, but you also have to sell the benefits and the equality of your product in comparison to the competitors. Because there's a reason people buy Mercedes instead of Kias. The Kias are cheaper, but they don't offer the same quality of the product. And so you have to be able to tell them that the product you offer has the same quality features as the higher price model. Okay? So I hope that helps. Um, Robert. Carrie Bones watching. Hey, Carrie. Next question is uh, from Carrington. Oh, hi, Carrington. Uh, how do you optimize your connections at networking events? So that real question is how do you network? So uh, I run a brand photography business in Massachusetts that helps brands grow through content creation, and I have been attending a fair amount of networking events, meeting people one-on-one, -on -one, follow up meetings, trying to expand my local connections and get to know more people. I've given out many referrals and gotten uh, thank you emails from people who booked clients based on my referral, but haven't seen a return yet come my way. What are some long-term and short-term strategies to improve my networking relationships? I don't expect a change to happen overnight, but would like to improve in the networking world, thanks. Well, this is a long question, really, Carrington, and probably deserves a phone call, but let me just start by saying, first of all, it's great you're going to networking events. That's good. You should go to as many of them as you can. But in a networking event, you know, you have to have a goal. The goal is to meet three people at the networking event and get their contact information, or maybe it's five. I don't know. But also, once you set that goal for meeting new people, you have to follow through with those people after the networking event. We'll talk about that in a minute. But here's mistakes I see at networking events. People get locked into one or two people that they already know. You have to be like a butterfly. And if you want to excuse yourself from a three or four group talk that you're having at a networking event, then you say, excuse me, I see somebody over there that I need to talk to. Excuse me, I see somebody over there that I need to talk to, and you go over there, right? And Another thing you can do at the networking event is be assertive. Hi, my name is uh, Beth, and I'm trying to meet as many people as I can tonight. W what's your name? You know, and if that bothers you, then you walk up to somebody and you say, Hey, my name is Beth, and uh, I was just trying to meet you. I have wanted to meet you. Whatever you want to say. But me, at a networking event, I just move around. And... If they have name tags on, I say, hey, Bill. And they go, hey. I say, hey, my name's Tom. I don't know anybody here. And uh, I'm just here to meet people, right? That's your approach if you don't, if you don't have another one. Uh, but the biggest mistake at the networking event is you get stuck with one or two or three people. And the second biggest mistake is you don't get any contact information. I work with a mortgage lender, and she drives me crazy. She goes to these networking events, and she comes away and she meets one person. She gets stuck with one person. And then the other thing that drives me crazy is she doesn't do a follow-up email to them the next day or within 24 hours. Hey, it was really nice to meet you, Steve, and I hope that I get a chance to see you again. By the way, I'm in the mortgage business. If you know anybody who needs a mortgage or would like help or answer, or help, like help with their mortgage or answer questions about mortgages, I'd be glad to help. Stephanie, okay? Um, 
Now, if you want to have a meeting with them after that, then you do it, say in the follow-up email, I'd like to schedule a cup of coffee. And then you get on the phone and call them. And this is to everybody in AO. This is driving me crazy. It's been driving me crazy for 10 years. And so you can imagine my frustration is building. Nobody wants to get on the phone. Nobody wants to get on the phone. Nobody wants to get on the phone. Well, I'll just text them. I'll just email them. Look, if texting and emailing worked better than in-person conversations, every major company in America would get rid of their sales force and just use texts and emails. Wake up, get on the phone and call people. And yes, it's frustrating. It's the most frustrating thing you do in building a business, at least for me, because there's nobody home. There are hangups. There are people who you call 20 times and still don't get a hold of, right? But the point is you've got to get on the phone. You've got to do outreach in person. It's very rare to build a business strictly on the basis, unless it's e-commerce, on the basis of uh, email and text marketing. And if you have an e-commerce business, you got to spend money on advertising. You don't have any money. So how do you get the money? You start by selling things one-on-one -on -one in person, either on the phone or in person. Okay? That's simple. Um, next, Lissandra. Lissandra says, what are sales strategies you would use to market your baker dessert services in a local area? It's the same as home services. First of all, I'd see if I could qualify for Google Home Services. Because if you can, then, and you have some money to advertise, you will get really great qualified leads. And uh, it's like um, Allison's uh, list or whatever that is, or uh, uh, Home Pro. It's like those services on steroids, but you got to qualify for it and they do a background check. So if you're a felon, don't even try. So anyway, um, but that's the first thing I'd do is I'd get an active presence on social media and I'd spend some money on advertising and I would not necessarily spend money on Facebook or Instagram advertising. I would spend it on Google advertising. The second thing I'd do is go to every networking event that I could. The third thing I do is call every events coordinator in the area and say, hey, this is what I do. I'd love to have an opportunity to work with you. Event coordinators hire caterers. The next thing I do is call the biggest companies in town in the HR area and say, look, we do catering. We can bring it into your office. We can take a cater an event, etc., etc." And after you do all that, you're going to have a really big catering business, okay? But those are the things that I would do. Um, next, this is from Cheston. He says, how can I create a bigger sense of urgency around making money? Now, I don't understand that question. I didn't when I read it the first time, but let's read his explanation. I've been an entrepreneur for 10 plus years and I've always made just enough, but I've never really had a strong desire to make more than just enough. Yes, I want to make more, have more, be more, but there are obviously some issues, serious mental hurdles I haven't been able to overcome. What mindset shifts do you recommend to go from being not money motivated to I can do, have, be more, with more income? What are different ways to look at the issue that could be motivating and exciting to me as opposed to just make more money? Are there different objectives you've experienced that are just as rewarding as having a big bank account that motivates and inspires you? Oh, sure, there's a lot of things that motivate and inspire me more than making money. I, I love doing this and I'm not getting paid for it. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm up on Sunday morning preparing for it, and here I am live to help you guys get what you say you want. So the first thing I'd say, Cheston, is you decide what you want. You know, you're arguing with yourself, and you're never going to win an argument with yourself. I'm happy where I am. I like taking Sunday mornings off. I like quitting at 3 o'clock some days. I like sleeping in some mornings. Okay, fine. You like all those things? then get the other thought out of your head, which is I want to be more, do more, and have more, because those two do not fit in the same mindset. Get rid of that and decide what you want. And then if you decide what you want, you'll figure out a way to get it. But you can, and this is one way, AO, you can talk to the mentors and you can talk to the other members of AO and ask them how they did it and then duplicate their behavior. But it starts with you, I can tell, working 80 hours a week. 
And when you tell me you can work 80 hours a week, I'll believe you're serious about wanting more, doing more, and being more. And until you do that, you're just kidding yourself. So, you know, forget it. Just be happy doing what you're doing, okay? You can't make yourself work 80 hours a week. You're never going to have what you want, okay? Next. And last, this is from Perry. Hey Perry, how do I evaluate new opportunities side businesses? Business description and background. I have a stable core business with a great team. We sold eight figures on Amazon last year through the FBA program and have trained our operations and admin teams so that we can step away from the business for a week or so at times. We currently have several ideas for side business that complement our core business. One, consulting with other Amazon sellers. Two, creating courses to help the process. Three, brand management. Four, doing private label on Amazon. In all of these cases, we would have to hire or build a new team to execute the idea. So how do you decide which idea to act on first? Thanks. Okay. So, uh, Perry, I tell everybody that's an entrepreneur, stay in your lane. Stay in your lane. Mind your own shit. You know? And until you build a business where, you know, Amazon is unlimited, until you build a business where you are very comfortable doing what you're doing, why experiment and spend your money on doing other things? You're bored. You have plenty of opportunity in the lane you're in. So my first advice would be to stay in your own lane and just keep building that business. Build it as big as you can, you know. Focus. And you read anything about entrepreneurs that fail you will see one of the reasons is because they spread themselves too thin. You know, stay with what you what you know. I can't give you any advice on those other businesses. They all sound like fine ideas, and if you were starting from scratch, probably you should pick one of those, but you're not starting from scratch. And so let's just keep building the business you have, okay? And that's the best advice I can give you. I lied. There's another question, okay? How do I start an ebook and sell it? Now, why anybody would ask me how to start an ebook and sell it, I don't know. Because I've never sold an ebook successfully. And so, what my first advice is find somebody who has sold an ebook successfully. And I can tell you how to write a book, I've written three of them. I'm on my fourth. Um, probably got another 10 in me if I uh, live that long. But, you know, the way you write a book is you decide what you want to write the book on. Okay, I have a ton of great information about barbering and I feel should be out in the world. It's an idea I wanted to know if there is any mentors that know where to start. Thank you. So the first thing you do is you write the book. <laughs> Steve Martin used to do a comedy routine where he said, you can pay no taxes on a million dollars. First, get a million dollars. <laughs> Funny, huh? First, write a book. And then once you get the book written, you'll figure out a way to sell it. But I, I will tell you how to write the book. And the best way to do it is to write down all of the ideas you want to convey and or, organize them in some logical order. Maybe that's 20 ideas, maybe it's 50. But if you don't have at least 10 good ideas that you want to convey, then you don't have a book. You've got a pamphlet, okay? And then once you write those down, under each one, write the idea that you want to convey. Explain it and then give some examples of that idea, as many as you need to fill up the book. So, Boxcar Millionaire has 22 chapters, first book I read, wrote down the 22 chapters, 22 ideas I wanted to share, and then I wrote the idea out that I wanted to share, and then I filled in with examples, stories that illustrated the point I was trying to make. And that ended up in being a 250 page book. So. Anyway, that's some advice about ebooks, and I hope it I hope it helps. Okay, so that's all the questions today, and I'm glad to answer these questions, and I hope they help. But the biggest thing I can tell you that will help you the most is that commit to working a full day. Figure out from time management standpoint how you can put more time into your company, and then. As you get that part down, the next step is to figure out how to make those hours the most productive that you can. And 
the question every entrepreneur should ask themselves once they figure out they need to work a lot is um, th this. What is the highest and best use of my time? What is the highest and best use of my time? I'll tell you a book that everybody that listens to this and hasn't got to a business with a million dollars should read is the E-Myth. It's the Entrepreneur Myth, E-Myth. And it shows you some real insight into building a business. It's a fantastic book. So try it. I've been, I'm reading the E-Myth Revisited, which is the second book, but you can start with the first one, which is the E-Myth, okay? And I look forward to seeing you guys in Nashville. And if I don't see you in Nashville, I hope I get to see you sometime in the future. Have a great day.